From the biggest tax cut in the country to the largest investment in K-12 education in more than a decade, to systemic reform of Ohio's Medicaid system, it was a pretty historic year here in the state Senate, and it was all done under the leadership of President Keith Faber. Today's Caucus Conversation. Senator, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We use the word historic. Uh, this was your first year as Senate president. How would you describe the successes of this year? I think we had a lot of great hits. Uh, we had a couple home runs, but uh, day to day, what we do in the Senate is hit base, base hits. We keep trying to improve Ohio's economy and keeping Ohio a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Back in January, in the first press conference that you had as Senate president, there were two themes that were talked about, job creation, economic development. And you talk about the major successes over the year. Let's start with the budget and tax cuts. Talk a little bit about what we did there. Well, this is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, tax cut in the country this year. Uh, it was $2.7 billion across the board, 10% for every Ohioan. But equally as important was a 50% cut for small businesses uh, on the first 250000 of income for small businesses. Those are businesses who, unlike their big business counterparts, pay the personal income tax. Big businesses are already exempted from the personal income tax. So we're trying to level the playing field. you got to remember almost 70000 Seventy percent of Ohio jobs are in small businesses. So anything we can do to help them be successful is going to go right back to strengthening Ohio's job and the economy, frankly. In addition to tax cuts, there's also the whole point about, uh, for economic development, educating the workforce. Uh, talk about the Workforce Development Program. Well, Senate Bill 1, our priority, first priority bill, is essentially a workforce uh, bill. It, it, it provides education opportunities for those workers who are underemployed. It partners with training institution, whether it's a community college, a vocational program, or other program out there, with the employers. Organizations and programs that have a relationship with the jobs uh, are going to get priority in that $25 million fund that is allocated up to $10,000 to a student, $100,000 per program. And the great thing about it, it's a revolving loan program. So when the money is paid back, it can go back into that program to be reinvested in another worker. Unlike grant programs that once the money's spent, it's gone, this program should continue and it should help us educate the needed workers uh, for years to come. That's uh, a lot of that's higher education, but we also made some major investments in K-12 education. Talk about that. Well, that's not just higher education. That's also community colleges, vocational training. It's for welders. It's for CNC machine operators. All of those jobs that are in great demand in our manufacturing economy. But on K-12 education, we did something pretty special. It's the largest increase in K-12 funding in more than a decade. Uh, nearly a billion dollars uh, put directly into our local schools to help educate our children. Uh, not only did we worry about the money, though, so much discussion about education is about funding. We also looked at how that spending is going. And we're talking about trying to make accountable our, higher, our, our K-12 system as well as our higher education in a way that is going to benefit Ohio. Uh, one of the things we did was the third grade reading guarantee. Uh, for far too long, we've been promoting kids who aren't prepared. And certainly by third grade, you ought to be able to read. And you shouldn't go to fourth grade if you're not able to read at a third grade. Why do I say that? Because we know that a large portion of the kids that are going to drop out, those 56,000 kids every year that drop out, we know that if they haven't been able to read by third grade, they're much more likely to drop out. So we're trying to do a holistic approach, but certainly making sure uh, the third graders can read isn't too much to ask. Well, and for parents out there who are thinking about this, it's not just saying, hey, if you can't read at this point, you're done. There are, there's intervention and other oh, programs. There's a done. lot of wraparound services to help those kids get ready. And they shouldn't know that only in third grade. They should have help at kindergarten, first grade, second grade to get them ready. Uh, my wife always says one of the reasons we're having problems with kids reading is we stop teaching phonics. Well, that may be something we have to look at. But the solution is first having expectations that everybody can meet. How you get there, let's leave that to our local educators and school boards. And, and your wife is an educator, by the way, correct? She is. <laughs> she is. Uh, healthcare, obviously a major issue uh, in the country. But here in Ohio, there was a lot of uh, you know, debate back and forth about what to do about Medicaid. The Senate took the approach of reforming the system. It doesn't matter how much money you put into it. It's about fixing the system systemically. Uh, talk a little bit about Senator Burke's bill. Sure. Dave Burke uh, came up with an idea that if we could bend the cost curve of Medicaid, historically Medicaid is going up 
at, at two to three times the rate of inflation. And that's just unsustainable. Uh, to put it in perspective, in 1980, Medicaid made up 16.9% of the state budget. At the end of this biennium, without expansion, Medicaid was targeted to be over 50% of the state budget unsustainable. So Senator Burke came up with the concept to try and bend that cost curve to stop that 9 or 10 percent year annual uh, inflation rate and get it down into a 3 or 4 percent range. If we can do just that, we'll save close to $7 billion between now and 2020. The bill that Dave Burke came up with, the Senate passed and now the House has passed and is sitting before the governor for signature, does just that. It focuses on per member per month costs and bends that cost curve down with things like medical homes, with encouraging uh, people to do health care instead of uh, sickness care, and, and to try and do a number of other things to try and incentivize people to do lowest cost op options. Those are all things that are going to improve the quality at the same time lower the cost. Those are just a few of the things. That we, that we accomplished here in the Senate this year. And, and if we had all day, we'd talk about more of them. But I want to ask you quickly about next year. Looking ahead to 2014, there's still quite a bit to do. Um, and one of the things that was just recently announced in the Senate is uh, the Public Works Initiative. Can you talk about that briefly? The Ohio Public Works Program started in 1987, and it was a 10-year bond issuance to provide money essentially for local communities to do infrastructure, things like sewer, water lines, uh, industrial park preparation, things that are going to help meet the infrastructure needs of local communities. It was expanded and extended in, uh, 2000, in 19, 2005, uh, and it expires in, in 2015. It's a 10-year program. It's going to end at about $150 million a year. It has been a very popular program. If you talk to local elected officials, uh, you talk to local government folks, they're going to tell you that this is a program that has been administered without favoritism. It doesn't just go to the big cities. It goes to all of Ohio. It's distributed regionally, and for that reason, it's very popular. Uh, what we're going to do is ask the voters in May uh, whether or not you want to extend that program for another 10 years at $175 million a year uh, and, uh, for the first five years and then $200 million a year for the second five years. The reason we think we're able to do this is because we've been very good fiscal managers. Uh, the Constitution allows Ohio a 5% of the general revenue fund debt ceiling cap. Unlike the federal government, we have to balance our budget. And what we're at right now is below 4%. Because we've been good fiscal managers, good stewards of the taxpayers' money, we believe we have some capacity. And even with this extension of, of the uh, public works program, we're still going to be below 4%. And so we're moving in the right direction, but we think it's appropriate for us to invest in, in those type of programs long term because it's going to be the infrastructure that, frankly, the people who are paying it back over the issuance of those bonds are going to benefit from. It's been a popular program. It's been an effective program. I think it's time for us to continue it. It's an economic development and jobs program, correct? Oh, certainly is. Yeah. It, it is uh, directly related to making places available to expand and grow business and, and frankly, also make uh, customers uh, happier in their, in their communities. You mentioned fiscal management. I want to, before we go, talk about one other thing that I know is a real important project of yours, and that is the balanced budget amendment. You talked about balancing our budget here in the state, um, but it's not something that's happening in Washington at the federal level, and you introduced a balanced budget amendment, correct? Absolutely, and it's passed. Uh, it is a resolution, frankly, calling on Congress to pass a constitutional balanced budget amendment. Uh, there are two ways we can amend the United States Constitution. One is for Congress to do it. In fact, that's the way it's been done year after year. There's a second way, however, and that is for the states, we're a state, uh, to call for a constitutional convention. Uh, we are in that resolution. If Congress doesn't pass a balanced budget amendment, we are calling uh, to join uh, other states to call for a constitutional uh, convention for the purposes of passing a balanced budget amendment only. We limited to that narrow purpose. Uh, I attended a Mount Vernon conference uh, about two weeks ago with other state legislative leaders uh, to talk about this very issue. And we believe we can narrowly focus it to that issue. Uh, we also believe that the Constitution is very clear. Uh, we are a federal system. The federal government has its roles, but the state has their role as well. And one of those roles is when the federal government doesn't act, or doesn't do the will of the people for the states to rein it back in. It's time for the states to act if the federal government won't do the right thing. Uh, the, the amendment, simple, calls for Congress to do what 49 other states have to do, and that's live within your means. It doesn't require them to do it overnight. Uh, they can set up the terms, 10 years, five years, whatever is appropriate. But certainly, living within our means is a good thing. Let me just point out one reason why. Uh, every taxpayer in America right now has $150,000 of federal debt on their backs. 
That, I view, is an immoral situation to keep our kids in. $17 trillion in federal deficit. Literally, while we were having the press conference with the governor and the speaker in Lima on this issue, the national debt went up another $100 million. Now, the governor and myself and the speaker are good speakers, but we're not worth $100 million. And so my point on all that is, is if we don't get control of this now, we're passing on to the next generation, our kids and our grandkids, uh, debt liability that they're just never going to be able to pay. It's going to de depress their standard of living. It's going to limit the options for America. And that's not good for my kids. It's not good for your kids. It's certainly not good for your grandkids. And you can find out more about this balanced budget amendment by going to our website, ohiosenate.gov slash BBA. That's ohiosenate.gov slash BBA. You can also uh, watch a video that we have up there about the balanced budget amendment, the event that you had up in Lima, and also uh, find out a little bit more, sign a petition uh, to put your name on the list as a supporter of this balanced budget amendment. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. As always, you can keep up to date with us every day on our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, at Ohio Senate GOP, or visit our website, ohiosenate.gov Republicans. Thanks for watching.